uh, Amy Martin is one of the interesting things as a journalist, and she uh, kind of got into writing this book, and, and but she's doing it not pretending to be the expert, but as a journalist interviewing the experts and tells this is a spiffy regional book about regional little trails and little how to get out in nature in uh, North Texas. And so this we're being broadcast and maybe somebody in Austin or something who is watching us online. Uh, you can, this is a interesting book, just a reference about the nature area, a nature, but then when you come to visit, there's a place you can, uh, a handy book to have to uh, go out and uh, explore uh, the uh, area, Tarrant County, and well, the whole five counties or something here. So without any more, Amy, uh, come and tell us uh, all about the book that just came out the beginning of July. I want to really thank y'all for inviting me here. It's really a pleasure. I enjoy coming to Fort Worth so much. Uh, the first third of the book is Natural History and Ecology. And it um, covers basically how, how the land came to be here. But at the same time, there's a bunch of neat topics in that section, like geology, weather with David Finfrock, the weatherman, uh, making your yard into a nature sanctuary, nature at night, um, all kinds of interesting stuff. The middle section is a field guide to plants and animals, over 100 species in North Texas. And there's so many excellent field guides out there. So I thought, well, to make myself different, what I'd like to do is instead make each entry, entry full of interesting tidbits about these plants and animals that you can use to liven up any party conversation. <laughs> so you might read it with that in mind. And uh, the last third is uh, 25 hiking adventures to places all over North Texas, which is a four county area. Uh, before I go into the talk, I wanted to point out some people here that were very helpful in the book, starting well from the far left, Bob O'Kinnon, Botany Bob, actually has his own little box in the native species or citizen science section. He has a, he has a little thing. Um, Bill Fryhide here was, I couldn't have made the deadline without Bill helping me with uh, some plant research. He really, I was, I was sweating and Bill stepped up and he helped me so much. I can't thank Suzanne Tuttle enough. She fielded so many questions all hours of the night. <laughs> and part of my learning curve with this was learning the Fort Worth Prairie. I'm a black land prairie girl and I am, I am deep in that dirt and I had to learn a whole new prairie and she made it fascinating to me, absolutely fascinating to me. I see Michelle back there, Via Franca. She was also very helpful and answered questions and this whole orientation I had to do to get to know Tarrant County and cross timbers and all of that good kind of stuff. So, um, so here are um, nine of my favorite photos. This is a big spring preserve in the Great Trinity Forest of um, Dallas. Uh, that is some of the wildest areas of, of um, the Great Trinity Forest. These are white egrets from, um, I think this was photographed at uh, Trinity River Audubon Center. And uh, that is breeding plumage. And how an egret can put green feathers on and then take them off, I don't know. It's magic to me. Could you know that a white-winged dove could be so beautiful? Nick DiGiaro makes all his birds look beautiful. Can you imagine that Julie Custer, this is shot at Hagerman Wildlife Refuge in the Big Meadow Pond. Can you imagine that she waded into the water and went upside down to get that photo? That's how these photographs, uh, these photographers are so devoted. Uh, Carol Clark, this is a prairie that in Plano that she went to bat for. It would be a non-prairie right now if it wasn't for Carol Clark. That is in the heart of Plano, too. Oh, you skipped one. You skipped one. There. Ah, yes. Connemara Meadow, where they are making meadow one plot at a time. Just an amazing enterprise. Bob's personal story was one of the most moving in the book. Dogwood Canyon in the Southwest Escarpment. This is near Cedar Ridge Preserve. 
I think it's got better vistas than Cedar Ridge Preserve. It is just gorgeous. If I say, ah, so you don't have to go places for your nature. You've got it right there. This is out of the Lane's garden. And this is out of Plano. <laughs> she says they come every year. She just accepts the poop and she doesn't, you know, swim in it when they're around. But look at that lovely little ramp. I just love it. So North Texas is a land of drama and I don't mean these folks. I mean the drama down below. And in the past, they creates uh, the natural treasures like the limestone escarpment that's in the southwest part of Dallas County, or the Cuesta upon which Sherry Caperton Nature Preserve um, exists. Both are adventure chapters in Wild DFW. It also creates the drama down below, below also creates the dark soil of the Blackland Prairie in places like Park Hill Prairie or the sandy soil of Bob Jones Nature Center, also both adventure chapters. Our land here was manifested by epic forces. We are in a pivotal place in the continent. It is surprisingly dynamic, North Texas is, full of contrasts and convergences, both in the land and in the weather above, which friend Brock and I got in a fascinating conversation about that. So North Texas was impacted by continental drift, a planet in constant movement, widening, making epic rifts, and merging, making mountains and new continents. So when a continental craton came wandering across the present, present Atlantic Ocean and rammed into current North America, it shoved the mountains on the coast all the way across the south and into here. Most of them reside deep in the mantle, but some of them manage to stay above ground. And that's why the Washita and Chickasaw Mountains go east-west and all the rest of the mountains on the continents go north-south. They got rammed that way. But it was the inland sea, the western interior seaway that truly shaped us. It sliced North America from Canada to the Gulf. It's also called the Cretaceous Seaway because that's the epoch that it dominated. Some geologists refer to Dallas for Worth as the Cretaceous Coast. It's the land of limestone. Cretaceous comes from the Latin word creta, meaning chalk. To quote from shores of an ancient ocean chapter of Wild DFW, over epics, Water repeatedly receded and rose with epic climate fluctuations and tectonic events, creating aquatic environments from deeper than skyscrapers to vast shallow seas and swamps to sandy shores. Layer upon layer of deceased microscopic calcareous sea creatures turned into Cretaceous limestone. We call it Austin Chalk because we're just the far north extension of it. Over time, that soft white rock decomposes into hard black dirt. Go figure. The Blackland uh, gumbo of Dallas is swamp mud, essentially. Austin Chalk is, uh, in North Texas is flanked by Taylor Marl and Eagle Mountain Shale, which have a sandier content and they erode much faster. Also from Wild DFW, University of Texas at Dallas Geosciences professor Robert J. Stern writes in his Geology of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, beneath the surface, limestone bedrock holds echoes of an ancient inland ocean in which monstrous sea lizards swam. These aquatic reptiles include mosasaurs, such as Dallasaurus turneri, turneri, a species named for the city, and Van Turner, who discovered the specimen, and it's now in the Perot. We also had plesiosaurs, which is kind of a long-necked sea lizard that kind of evokes the Loch Ness monster. 
The continent's oldest intact mosasaur fossil was found north of I-30 on the western edge of Dallas called Chalk Hill Road. So I think that is totally cool. So we don't have dinosaur fossils. We have marine fossils, including turtles and fish and lots of sharks. But cartilage in the sharks doesn't fossilize very well, but their teeth do. And you can find them all over a section of Post Oak Creek in Sherman, Texas, which has turned out to be one of the hottest fossil spots around. Another thing that adds to the area's dynamic nature is that it's off its rocker. You can see that in Scooter Smith's magnificent graphic here. In general, things get harder, higher, and drier as you go west. So check out that tilt. It's not all that common to be in an area with these tilted layers. Old, older layers are generally always at the bottom like the Texas Craton at the bottom left, right there. Um, it is billions of years old, the Texas Craton is, because it's the Craton, it's right above the continent. Um, at some point, East Texas collapsed, it kind of sunk. And when it did, all the layers tilted. And you can see a little bit of East Texas Basin over there on the right. So we've got eight or so geological area layers through the four county area, Collin, Denton, Dallas, and Tarrant. So when I say North Texas, I'm only referring to these four counties. So if you look carefully when you're driving along I-30, you'll feel it change. So going west from Dallas, the hard Austin chalk of downtown Dallas sinks into the softer Eagle Ford shale of Irving and Grand Prairie, right about where the old Naval Air Station is. And then the flat woodbine sandstone of Arlington, and then back up into limestone again. Subtle, but epic. Think about that when you drive I-30 next time. It's a geologic lesson. But the time frame is definitely epic. On the eastern edge of North Texas, the limestone is 67 to 130 million years old. On the west side, you guys, it's more like 300 million years old. So things get older as you go west. And your limestone is very different from Austin Chalk or Dallas's limestone, because your limestone is kind of more on the shore and so you've got lots of shells in your limestone and that makes it much harder. Each of these geologic layers decomposes into a different soil. And each type of soil gives rise to a unique plant community. And that plant community determines the insects and the wildlife that live there. That adds up to rampant diversity. If you know what to look for, which Wild DFW can help you do. It's all determined by bedrock, but not this bit. <laughs> Slicing all this up are the many forks of the Trinity, especially the West Fork, which crosses all these layers. The Trinity River's bed is much older on the West, and it goes over much harder limestone and shallower soil than it does in the East, making the West and Clear Forks very, different from the Elm Fork and the Trinity Mainstead. And this is something that the Dallas powers that be have never figured out. We will never be Fort Worth's Trinity. When the ancient ice sheets were melting, all that water had to drain somewhere. The Trinity was once epically wide, much miles wider than it is now. So there are alluvial terraces all along the Trinity, consisting essentially, as Rob Denkhouse called it, Ice Age gravel. It's the blue lines flanked by brown that's in the middle right there, kind of towards the right. There were also rivers in ancient times that are no longer around, and those also left belts of alluvial sands, which accounts for some of the post-Oak Savannah spots in Dallas County, 
that we'll talk about in a bit. So I think that all this epicness and drama down below makes everything above it just that much more interesting. A little knowledge does so much. So let's turn to the present day and merge the idea of edges and ecotones. We all see these maps of our ecosystems. and Y'all know it from heart that we've got the Blackland Prairie, which is a, a, basically on top of the Austin Chaw, and that takes up almost all of the east half. Before settlement, trees were mainly in the riparian corridors and ravines where the wildfires and bison couldn't reach them. So the trees reassert themselves in the eastern cross timbers, a mosaic of blackjack and post oak forest and prairie patches. And that arises from the woodbine sandstone and little bits spreading beyond it. Then going west, there's the prairie again, which is known as the Fort Worth Prairie, Grand Prairie, and it has some other names. Going back to the eastern edge of all this, the Piney Woods eases into the Blackland Prairie as the post oak savanna belt, which is scattered trees, post oaks obviously, and grasslands. And on the far west of all of this, you've got the Western Cross Timbers stretching towards Avenue. So it, it seems like an orderly step down from forest through prairie, through prairie and woods to prairie again, but then flop right in the middle of the Blackland Prairie is the Great Trinity Forest. 6,000 acres of hardwood, mostly bottomland that spreads well beyond the riparian corridor. It's quite the outlier that makes it very special. Except edges are messy. The ecoregions are much more complex than that map I just showed. The more indents and the more extensions that an edge has where two disparate ecosystems meet, the more diversity it's going to have. Lobed insects create safe places for wildlife to hide and to monitor for food. And wildlife watchers will tell you the edge is where the action is. Mm -hmm. The forested areas that protrude into food rich meadows provide more opportunities to eat safely and spy for threats. A lot of food bearing plants need the protection of some woods but also get some direct sunlight. So this scenery here may seem tame, but for many species, this is absolutely ideal habitat. Again, right in the middle of Plano. So the isolated islands of an ecosystem create even more edges. So there are dollars of post oak savanna in Dallas County in Seagoville. There's 300 acres of it for some reason. And um, sadly, it's lost, almost lost its savanna. Um, it has a loop trail and one half of it goes through Eastern Cross, goes through Post Oak Savanna and the other half of it goes through Blackland Prairie. It is the coolest thing to see. Uh, the Trinity River Audubon has this funny little dollop of Post Oak Savanna right in the middle of it, they call the overlook. And it's so shocking because you're walking along and all of a sudden the plants change. And then it goes back to what it was before. It's about the size of half of this room, you know. Um, there is post oak savanna in Oakland Cemetery, south of Fair Park. The U.S. Um, Southwestern Medical Center, where the famous rookery is, that's a dollop of post oak savanna. And the old cemetery about Dallas City Hall is as well. So all that messiness has makes for a lot of edge. And interaction at the edge drives evolution. So there's more diversity, more fertility, and more create creativity where opposites meet. And sometimes you get something that is beyond either one, like coastal estuaries and, and tidal pools that are not one thing or the other, but something in between. Now on to the big edge. So to quote from the chapter, Wild, uh, Wild Dallas Fort Worth, the great Eastern deciduous forest once stretched from the Atlantic Ocean 
to west of the Mississippi River. So dense, according to folktales, that a squirrel could cross the entire distance, leaping from tree to tree and never touching the ground. That dry line there, that marks um, where the West begins. Um, roughly the, the 100th meridian, which is the eastern border of the Panhandle. In some places, that dry line in some places, that dry line um, is that is where the climate shifts from semi-arid and then arid at the 98th meridian, one county west of Fort Worth, roughly at Mineral Wells. The dry line is shifting eastward because of climate change. In Dallas and to some degree in Fort Worth, we are fortunately influenced by the Gulf winds, and that keeps our rainfall up but it also creates really high humidity. And the high humidity that we experienced in Dallas in the summers this year is going to be our norm. So rainfall, rainfall after being fairly consistent all the way across the South starts to drop off at the Texas border. So annual precipitation decreases one inch for every 20 miles that you go west from Louisiana. So the east side of North Texas is quite a bit wetter than the west. This makes east, this makes North Texas an ecotone, an epic edge where two disparate ecological regions merge into each other. The lush eastern deciduous forests of the east gives way to the dry western plains right here in North Texas. And the Great Trinity Forest is the last bastion of that great Eastern deciduous forest. This is totally cool. And when people get this, they'll go, oh, there's so much more to North Texas than I thought. So we have a lot of little edges and we also have a great big edge. We're basically all edge and that equals diversity. But it's diversity that you have to be aware of to see. And I hope that Wild DFW provides that education that makes that possible. Because once North Texas nature is appreciated, people will be more motivated to care for it and preserve it. The preface to Wild DFW states, North Texas isn't widely known for its nature. The book aims to change that. Our nature is not over there in remote wilderness. It's here. It's hidden along rivers and creeks. It's tucked away on the fringes of reservoirs, on rocky hilltops or floodplains, wherever development was unfeasible. But it's also in your yard if you invite it in. Thousands of people move to North Texas every day. Ah, not every day, God. And they tend to dismiss our nature because it's not like what they had at home. We don't have the deep rivers swollen by generous rainfall like the Midwest has. We have drought and deluge prairie rivers like the Trinity and the Red. These people think that North Texas is flat. Would you ever think that before we filled every valley and ravine that we had, and turn them into reservoirs that we used to have a lot of terrain change. We just filled it up with water and there is still a lot of terrain change when you get around the reservoirs and the waterways. So North Texas is not a vista driven landscape generally. It's far more interesting and intimate. And these folks, when they arrive in North Texas, they're kind of clueless about where to get their nature fixed. They need more than listings of trails. They need education about the natural history and ecology. They need to know where the flora and fauna that lives here. And they need hike descriptions that help them experience North Texas nature. As the opening chapter states, abandon the idea that prime outdoors means majestic mountains, deep canyons, and ocean views. 
North Texas nature fosters a profound intimacy that is best experienced close up with unfolding layers that invite lingering exploration. Nature here is not a distant vista that you admire. It's something that you immerse yourself into and become a part of while it becomes a part of you. So let's look at where you can experience a lot of this in person. And we'll start with the Trinity's three major preserves, each with a variety of terrains that will satisfy all. And I just want to point out, you notice how the West Fork of the Trinity River is going east-west? Going to have a discussion with the um, Dallas uh, Paleontology Society to ask what caused it to change course like that. Now, I think it's the Southwest Escarpment in the Southwest corner of the county. Because that is definitely an outlier going due east and west like that. So, your favorite, the Fort Worth Nature Center, your home turf. This is where I tell people to take newbies and guess two words, bison and alligators. Can't beat that. I miss those prairie dogs. I wish the prairie dog colony was still around. Uh, it is a wild place, but it has historic landmark status for its civilian conservation for stonework. It benefits from good management from Fort Worth Parks Department and lots of attention from you guys and from the Cross Timber Master Naturalists. The refuge is located on Lake Worth in the northwest corner of Fort Worth, which it's an impoundment of the West Fort. Um, at 3,600 acres within city limits, it is one of the nation's largest city-owned nature centers. It is big enough for bison, which have their own viewing platform now, and over 20 miles of hike and trails. There are at least six types of soil at the refuge, which creates great diversity in a variety of habitat. As you drive in, you can take in those medium grass prairies and the savanna, and you can just get that big sky feeling. And every time I go, there are just so many reptiles, rabbits and grassland birds. And I love seeing the road runners just kind of skitter out. The flip side of that habitat is the Lotus Marsh, a fabulous wetland habitat lined with reeds and full of turtles, snakes, and a gator or two. People don't realize what a good place this is for watching waterfowl in the winter. It's insane. The star of the show is the Canyon Ridge Trail. It's a tough trail, lots of ups and downs. You're guaranteed to see white-tailed deer, and this is where I send people in Fort Worth when they want to see deer. So stop a while in the stonework and enjoy the view and of the lake because you're gonna need it because the canyon ridges are really tough trail. But for a piece of my heart, how many of you have been on the Cross Timbers Trail on the other side of everything? Oh, come on. You all got to do it. You all got to do this trail. I'm telling you, Kate Morgan took me over there. She nearly killed me. Ugh. She is one heck of a hiking partner. I tell you, she had a lot of years on me and she just left me in the dust. Um, but I love that trail. It's Western Cross Timbers, not Eastern. So that was really cool to experience. Plains pocket gophers, which have this insane mating rituals in the, in the springtime, wild turkeys, huge fox squirrels. There are ring-tailed cats back there in the woods. Far as they know, they've been sighted. They think they're still back there. It is so remote and wild and hardly anybody goes there. You can just disappear into the silence. It's truly one of my favorite places. So let's head northeast to Denton and the Clear Creek Natural Heritage Area. 2,900 acres, that's big, owned by the Army Corps of Engineers, but managed by the city of Denton. And they do a good job. Wetlands, riparian woods, prairie, upland woods, big creek, big river, at least eight miles of trails are always putting new ones in. Clear Creek never stops surprising me. The Elm Fork Master Naturalist lavished attention on it and it really shows. It hangs out halfway between Lake Ray Roberts and Louisville Lake, mostly on the west side of the Elm Fork. 
So when the big rains come and Ray Roberts gets full, that water has to go somewhere and into Clear Creek Preserve it goes. It's a very wet place. It is a huge flood control operation, kind of very much like Fort Worth Nature Center is. The trails along uh, Clear Creek are, um, well, wait a minute. I'll get to that. There's a joke with that. <laughs> Uh, the trails along Clear Creek are the place to experience cathedral woods with huge trees and a rich understory. Jaw-dropping, gorgeous. So many birds when you get deep in those woods. And they have swamp rabbits, like bunches of swamp rabbits. That's big stuff to us nerds. Uh, the creek confluence with the Elm Fork is also really special. So... If you take the big look or loop around, there's a giant wetlands with lots of beavers, but you just got to hope that that log jam on the Elm Fork at Highway 360 is not back in the water, uh, or it's a very wet slog, but lots of fun. It was a lot longer for us to back up and go the way around than to go straight through this, and we just went through. And it was great fun because I got to see floating rafts of fire ants. <laughs> <laughs> and big balls of, of frog eggs. It was frog jelly, I'm told, is what that is. If you drop down Elm Fork to Louisville Lake, you've got Lake Louisville Lake Environmental Learning Area, which everybody calls Leela. And it's at the base of the dam over 2,600 acres. White-tailed deer, wild turkeys, river otters, bald eagles nest there every year. Rare songbirds, rare owls, it's got it all. You can even camp there, which is wonderful. They've been doing a lot of night sky events there. Louisville has a new educator who's into astronomy and it is so fun to be there at night. So if you have a chance to catch those and I occasionally will do moon hikes there. Many of y'all um, have walked the Blackjack Trail out of uh, the Education Center at Leela, but if you'll read the Wild DFW chapter and walk it again, I guarantee it will be completely different to you. The trail dips in and out of Blackland Prairie and Eastern Cross Timbers. Talk about edge. I had hiked it many times and I had never noticed. That's why all those 25 adventures, I took it with people who knew the land a lot better than I did. So the same with the, um, the Turn Marsh Trail. If you'll read the chapter and then go hike that trail again, you'll perceive how prior landowners' management practices shaped the land. You'll notice a patchwork where the woods are very different. You'll go mm, 40 yards and it'll change. And then 40 yards, and it'll change again. And uh, some of them have very young trees. Some of these patches have very old trees. Some of them have invasives. Some of them do not. That chapter is a tutorial on what's called go back land, which is a theme of the book because almost all nature in North Texas was at one point farmed or ranched or hay. We don't have anything virgin here. When the Louisville Dam was created, the Elm Fork was rerouted. And so if you go to the Cicada Trail at Lake Louisville, it goes along the old channel. And you'll watch and you'll see how water-loving trees are dying out and more drought-tolerant ones are taking their place. But if you'll go to the new channel that's at the end of the main road, it's a really fine place to bird and get your feet in the river, just right directly in the river. And it's also hilarious to watch the fishermen, fisher people, humans, duke it out with all the herons and the egrets there because they're all after the same fish. And the herons and the egrets are quite fond of stealing the fish from the fishermen. So it's it's uh, Darwin at its at its best. If you need something a little easier to handle, Spring Creek Forest Preserve in North Garland is kind of a scaled down version of those big preserves. There's no wetlands or river, but a big creek, 
There's riparian woods, upland woods, limestone prairies, just really a little bit of everything. It's got a unique mix of trees and some of them are just huge. A few of the smaller preserves are just perfect examples of their ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And when people ask me, what's your favorite preserve? I have to say, Sherry Caperton is at the top of the list, which used to be called Southwest Nature Preserve. They changed the name in the middle of the book being put out. I had to go through and change it, like all throughout the book. Sherry. <laughs> <laughs> But um, uh, it, there's hardly a finer example of Eastern Cross Timbers around. When people ask me about Eastern Cross Timbers, I say, go there. You will see it in all its level, in all its glories. So Cape Park takes over an entire cuesta, which is a geologic feature that's a direct result of those tilted layers that you saw. The east side is a long slope with switchback trails. And you, every time you're at a different curve in the switchback, you get a different view of the ponds there. And then you get up to the top and the west side just boom, drops directly off as if it's praising the setting sun. So for thousands of years, peoples have, indigenous people have used that western edge, which is about 700 feet high, as a lookout spot. And you can almost see downtown Fort Worth from there. The overlook is near the iron ore knob, which is covered in, in rusting boulders. And it creates an ideal habitat for lichens. So if you're looking for a place to see nature's art at its best, go up to the iron ore uh, knob um, at Sherry Caperton. And this is pale compared to the lichens that are up there, most of which were super colorful, but I didn't have a good photo. Do you want more Rocky Wonders? Well, so many people are familiar with Cedar Ridge Preserve, 600,000 visitors a year, God almighty. It's a volunteer operation, jeez. Um, and it's on a big Austin Chalk escarpment. But if you, if you go there and you take the Cattail Pond, there's two main trails, Cattail and Escarpment Pond, go behind the Cattail Pond, you can actually see Austin Chalk and Eagle Fort Shale meet each other. You can see them feathering into one another. And it is that intersection of soft and hard bedrock of Austin Chalk and Eagle Fort Shale that creates the preserve's famous vistas. You can see it, it just boom, drops right off. I call it the Southwest Escarpment and you can get a much quieter experience of it without 600,000 visitors a year uh, at Dogwood Canyon Audubon across the farm to market road. It'll still give your legs a workout, but you'll see more birds and wildlife. And it's got better vistas because the vistas all point in different directions. And it's got this really cool grove of dogwoods, flowering dogwoods completely out of region. There's a slender escarpment of Austin chalk and it is in Pleasant Grove, which is Southeast Dallas County. There's lovely views of the Northern uh, Great Trinity Forest. Most people don't know that the Northern, the Great Trinity Forest goes that far North. Um, and you can get up on the Cyan Overlook and you can see all the way to Cedar Hill and the broadcast towers there. Um, but there's also some gentle low woods and some trails. And there's just a lot of Native American pioneer history on the Piedmont Ridge. The Herd Nature Sanctuary in McKinney is also on a significant Austin Chalk escarpment. And it has these wonderful descending slopes and you get these different ecologies as you go down the slope. It is chock full of white-tailed deer because they know they're not gonna be hunted there. So they are, you can get, I don't know, within 10 yards of them and they don't run away. They just kind of look at you and go, yeah, you're running my view and just kind of wander off. Um, but uh, it has um, rich riparian and lowland woods that are often flooded. It has astounding wetlands, one of the best I've ever seen, and impressive prairie restorations. Bless Dave Powell. Wild DFW also covers the um, um, Isle de Bois, unit, uh, oops, 
There we go. Nice concept. Um, Wild FW covers the Isle de Bois unit of Ray Roberts Lake State Parks. Hey, who's been there? I tell you. All right, that's a better showing than I usually get. Usually it's like one or two hands. Um, I, it's just great. It's the only lake I'll swim in. It's really got a great E. coli rating, like, oh, something low, you know. Sandy beaches, rocky, it's, it's great. Uh, it's a terrific example of Eastern Cross Timbers. Then you can go to the Johnson Branch on the other side of the lake, and it's a completely different ecology. Uh, there's vast stretches of excellent blackland prairie, and there are white-tailed deer everywhere at, Lay at Ray Roberts State Park. And uh, yet within it, there's a patch of pine forest. Go figure. But if you know someone who's not very ambulatory and they're wanting to see nature, tell them to go drive around Ray Roberts State Park because they will see wildlife and flowers and just all, all kinds of great stuff. Um, speaking of prairie, there is uh, Northeast Collin County, there's Park Hill Prairie. The preserve is over 300 acres, but within it is a 50 acre Blackland Prairie remnant managed by the Nature Conservancy. It's glorious, even magical before settlement. And we're doing a, um, um, a solar eclipse walk there in a couple of weeks. Should be just fun. Go a step beyond that with the Fort Worth Prairies on U.S. Army Corps of Engineer land on the east side of Benbrook Lake. You go 50 yards in, maybe even a little less, and it is totally frontier. You know, you forget. And the Chisholm Trail used to cut right through there. You just really disappear into time. But sadly, this parcel here is now a college campus. You can get a more intimate prairie experience at Tandy Hills Natural uh, Area with hilltop prairies, shallow soil atop hard limestone, yet flowers, wildflowers could not be more abundant. It's probably the, whoops, gotta get to Don's photo here, yeah. Um, but um, it, it is the bestest place in North Texas for wildflowers, definitely. And, I tell you, you don't go to Tandy Hills and step off the trail and do any photo shoots or any nonsense like that. I tell you, Don Young and his volunteers will have a serious talking to with you. And and he says, so I just I bore them to death, but you know, I I tell them how special Tandy Hills is and they're messing it up, and well, they leave. And that's what that was his goal. So he is, he is, I call him a, a warrior with a gimpy hip. Uh, the Great Trinity Forest um, in Dallas takes up a big chunk of Wild DFW's adventures. It's 6,000 acres or Dallas's greatest and most neglected asset. I tell you, if Fort Worth had this forest, what it would do? Oh, my God. It, it, ugh, don't get me started. Uh, I get more questions about Great Trinity Forest than any place else. And people ask me, how can I experience it? And I say, it ain't easy. That's by intent. But while DFW tries to help, if you want to experience it, the Trinity River Audubon Center's forest trail is the easiest way. Parallels the entrance roads, apart from the other trails, most people don't go to it. Um, it is um, well-maintained, wide in trails. It's perfectly safe. You're not going to run into any weird people. It's a great place to kind of ease your way into the Great Trinity Forest. But thanks to volunteers from the North Texas Master Naturalist and others, the natural trail segments of the Ned and Jeannie Fritz Texas Buckeye Trails are rocking once again. Mm -hmm. I took some television reporters there and they were completely blown away. 10 minutes from downtown Dallas and there's deer. If you're willing to go wild, there are lots of off-trail wanderings from those Buckeye trails into the Bonton Woods. And there are plans for new trails and we're marking them right now that will connect the Buckeye trails to White Rock Creek. But my favorite spot in the Great Trinity Forest is the Holland Trail. And it was made by equestrians from the Texas Horse Park. It is a near perfect example of bottomland hardwood forest. 
the Virginia wild rye is higher than your hips. And if you're lucky and you notice the little flags on the trees, you'll be able to find the White Rock Creek confluence with the Trinity River, which to me is the heart of the great Trinity forest. And finally in the forest, Goat Island Preserve is in Southeast Dallas. And it's a large chunk of Great Trinity Forest between the river and a tall dike. Once you're past that dike, you just disappear into miles and miles and miles of trails. Huge trees, so many pileated woodpeckers and tremendous river views. I mean, it's worth y'all coming over from Fort Worth to see. I tell you, it's worth the drive. So coming down the home stretch, winter's coming. And it is time for waterfowl, water-loving birds, waders, shorebirds. Coming here for the winter, as Charlie Amos says, when birds go south, they come here. This is their south. So you go to Village Creek Drying Beds next to River Legacy Park in Arlington in fall and winter. It's surrounded by really tall dikes. So once you're in there, it's like a lost world. And um, wildlife, it is just, if you go there in the spring when the, when the birds are laying eggs and you go there in the early morning, it's like a wildlife melee because everybody wants eggs for breakfast. <laughs> and so everybody's looking for those eggs, mammals, snakes, turtles, everybody's looking for it. Um, but it's a great place. I just wish Arlington managed it better. They're piping out water to a golf course. They should be putting it in there. It's, I don't know, I don't know. we're gonna be started in. Um, more water birds, plus river otters, spotted gar, and more at Bunker Sands Wetlands Center in Seagaville. This is a surprisingly great place to do winter hiking. It's very sunny, but you can hike all the dikes. You can get miles and miles of hiking in. And there's a bunker uh, pond trail, and it's just, it's, a, it's underrated as a hiking destination. Tens of thousands of waterfowl and, over, and other birds overwinter at Hagerman National Wildlife Refuge on Lake Texoma on the Oklahoma border. It is on a large shallow cove or inlet, and it has abundant fish and crustaceans. But the refuge is a very good host and they plant many acres of winter grains to feed these birds and also keep them out of the farmer's fields nearby. There are free Saturday van tours. And again, if you know someone who has ambulatory issues, you can take a van ride there on Saturdays and sometimes Sundays. They also have a car tour, which is really easy to follow. And you're guaranteed to see birds, especially if you go in the late fall, winter and into early spring. But Hagerman, what people don't realize, is um, great even after the water birds have gone back north. It's 16,000 acres and there are no 20 miles of trails at least. And you're often gonna be the only one on there because people think of it as a winter destination. It's got upland woods, prairies, lake views, bog ponds. It's got lovely stuff. And it's got this great visitor center, and they just put in a quarter acre pollinator garden. You know how big that is? Oh, they are fabulous, and I'm sure y'all are part of that. Um, it, it is just fabulous, and I have been following Hagerman since it was a really dilapidated trailer on a hilltop, and I have watched them grow and grow and grow strictly by volunteers loving the place. After a while, the federal government was like, okay, I guess since you've got people coming here, we better build ourselves a visitor center. And they did. But I have to stress that while the FW, oops, that's one. I caught it, he caught it with the train going by. How cool is that? Okay. Um, but I have to stress that while the FW is not a book about land, it's a book about people. So each chapter begins with a personal vignette that places people in the midst of nature, enjoying it, preserving it. It stresses that humans are a part of nature. And all throughout, there are stories about you. People who love plants, insects, birds, mammals, 
reptiles, and so much more that they learn everything possible about them. And they are so enthusiastic about sharing. I consulted with a lot of professional experts to write Wild DFW, but I learned the most from these quote unquote amateurs. You'll discover people in the book that found deep personal healing from immense loss, from autism and ADD, from anxiety and physical ailments through nature. Nature is more than outdoor recreation. It's essential for our mental and physical health. By God, we should be funding it that way. This book is an extended love letter to you, to all you people that aid nature. I tell people at my talks that y'all are the type of people who plant trees the shade they will never sit under because it needed to be done. Your altruism absolutely floors me, moves me so deeply. As the book states, it is indeed a gift to learn about nature, but to preserve it, that's to create a true legacy. So I hope I have enthused you about North Texas nature. Please spread the word about this and about Wild DFW. I invite you to come to my website, wild-dfw.com. There's all kinds of resources there. There's links. If you were mentioned in the book or the place was mentioned or the group, you've got a link there on the community page. All these photographers, there's a page devoted to them, and you can click the links and see more of their work. Um, there's just all kinds of good stuff there. And also Wild DFW at Facebook and Instagram. Um, every day, every week, I make several posts about groups like you. I've posted about you guys before. And uh, I do posts about the groups that are mentioned in the book. So you can come there and see what an amazing community is out here in North Texas. So here's what I'm on to next which is the biography of uh, Texas's most important and original environmentalist, Ned Fritz. If it wasn't for Ned Fritz, the Trinity River would be a barge canal straightened all the way from the east side of Fort Worth to the Gulf. And he and some other wonderful people prevented that from happening. The 50th anniversary of that was this March. He created 36,000 acres of wilderness in East Texas forests. He started the Land Trust Movement, Texas Land Conservancy is a group he started under another name. Also, Texas Conservation Alliance, he started that as Texas Committee on Natural Resources. There is so much of your life is impacted by Ned Fritz. It's a, a biography in the making, so I invite you to just drop by the website and see what's going on. I'm fixing to load in all the information about his Buckeyes. I still talk about poison ivy to anybody in that link. Uh, <laughs> people are needlessly mean to the rash. I can tell you how to treat it. And I'm hoping that Timber Press will say yes to putting out a, re, a new edition of this book. I'll know sometime this fall. So that's my dog and pony show, y'all. There we go. <laughs> I am happy to take questions. I have no idea if I went over time or not. I need to watch this. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I, I am. Uh, it's online. It's online. Yes. Okay. I think I talk like a fire hose, and they're like, what? Did I? They forget their questions because I'm just on to the next thing. You know? <laughs> so. How about that, Frank? Yes. Do you have any areas that have ever been found that are totally original? Yes, there are areas that have never been plowed. And of course, Native Prairies Association of Texas keeps up with every single one of those. But there are some east, uh, eastern cross timbers parcels that have never been lumbered, never been bothered. And I am very proud of Fort Worth Parks Department for saving a significant parcel of them just recently. Uh, the eastern cross timbers are very underrated. Um, and uh, there is more of that than, because as Rob Denkhouse pointed out, 
not good lumber. So a lot of the east Eastern cross timbers got saved. There are like hmm, over 50 acres of um, never been plowed um, prairie at White Rock Lake. Uh, surprising, you know, so we, we kind of owe the places that were never plowed to dairy farmers. <laughs> dairy farmers realized that, that that native grass was really good for their cows, made really good milk, and so they just let the cows graze that. And if it wasn't for dairy farmers, there would be very little prairie left. Um, but almost all of the forest has been cut down. Uh, like I said, Eastern Cross Timbers is a wonderful ex exemption from that. But most of the Great Trinity Forest is, is regrowth. It is go-back land. Um, and most of the trees there are not over um, 70 years old. Um, and so you get this interesting phenomena, and the Leela chapter talks about this, and some of the other chapters do too, is that when you're going through a forest, you'll notice that there's a lot of young trees, and then there's occasional big old trees. Those were left by ranchers and, and dairy cattle people for shade. Thank goodness. And also sometimes they would leave groves of pecan trees because they wanted those pecans. And sometimes they would leave a belt of trees along the river. But there's been so much river modification that a lot of that forest has also gone away. So yeah, we, we, we don't have that virgin stuff. But that's kind of what I'm doing while DFW Forest is, is to help people appreciate what we've got and what, what survivors this land is. You know, when Ned Fritz, who was trying to save the Great Trinity Forest from development, they said, oh, that's just, you know, that's just grown back trees. And he says, so? So what? You know, it is still valuable. It still has wildlife in it. I still love hiking through it. It still cleans the air. It still filters the water. It's valued and should be valued, you know? Um, we may not have wilderness, but we've got good stuff. We've got some good stuff. And I think the Fort Worth Nature Center has some serious stretches of unmolested land, you know? Another question? Yes, ma'am. We do have chat question, the solar eclipse walk, where can we find information for that? Um, the solar eclipse walk that I'm doing with the Blackland Prairie Texas Master Naturalist, but we'll sneak in, and uh, that would be on my website, wild-dfw, there's a talks and walks tab. So I'll be back here in Fort Worth mm, another half a dozen times, um, and I'm doing a great walk with the Native Prairies Association of Texas, I guess, in a couple of weeks. Um, and we're going to walk the Benbrook Prairie, and then we're going to talk. And I'm developing this talk about, well, learning to love the Fort Worth Prairie and, and getting to know Fort Worth and getting to know Tarrant County and, and how I've kind of fallen in love with the place and, and how different it is and how much the land informs the personalities of each of those two cities, Fort Worth and Dallas. Um, it, it, it's really in the bedrock, it really is. And I just think it is hilarious that these two cities with a rivalry have had a wall of Eastern Cross Timbers in between the two of them. I mean, this is almost like a, a rivalry built from dirt. Uh, the fact that Fort Worth used to send cow carcasses and blood from the stockyards into the Trinity and down to Dallas was part of the rivalry. Uh, unfortunately, they don't do that anymore. But you can read about that in the Trinity chapter in the history of the West Fork as the River of Death. Questions? Yes, yeah. <laughs>